Good afternoon, everybody. I could have your attention. Um, before I begin with my remarks, I should let you all know that teachers and preachers have a first row issue. Just want you to know, I'm paying attention. They like to see the first row filled, but that's okay. Um, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to, uh, to welcome to South Dakota, and particularly to Dakota State University, uh, David O'Sullivan, the Ambassador of the European Union to the United States. He comes with his wife, Agnes, who's here in the front row, and he has two members of staff, Maeve and uh, Stella, who've traveled with him in his entourage, and um, has been, uh, for the last couple of days, has been traveling across South Dakota, so he's seen a little bit more than just this end of the state. As the European Union's top diplomat to the United States, Mr. O'Sullivan oversees the EU's bilateral relationship with the US and the direction and work of the EU delegation, including political, economic, and commercial affairs. He's had a long and distinguished career spanning over three decades, and he's served a number of senior official posts in the European public service. He, uh, he has, uh, we publicized his bio earlier on and he asked me to keep it short, but I thought you would be interested to know that Mr. O'Sullivan graduated from Trinity College Dublin with a degree in economics and sociology, and he completed postgraduate studies at the College of Europe in Bruges or Brugge, whichever way you pronounce it. He was a gold winning, gold medalist winning debater. Um, in, uh, while at Trinity College, and he has an honorary doctorate from the Dublin Institute of Technology, and a second honorary doctorate from his alma mater, Trinity College. Um, he uh, spent his early life attending grade school in California, so he's quite familiar with the United States, but he speaks English, French, Spanish, German, Japanese, and Irish. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. David O'Sullivan, Dr. David O'Sullivan. And I have uh, asked our moderator, Professor Bottom, that I uh, have the prerogative to ask the first question. Um, Mr. O'Sullivan, it would be helpful, I think, for this audience if you could just briefly explain what the European Union is and how it's different from concepts we might have of the continent of Europe. Um, I think that would be um, an interesting place to start, and then uh, Professor Bottom can take over the moderating. Thank you. Well, President Griffiths, thank you very much indeed for those words of welcome, and thank you very much indeed for this opportunity to visit Dakota State University. What a splendid space you have here. Uh, and I've had the opportunity with the President to discuss a number of the very interesting things going on, particularly in the, the cyber sphere, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, you emphasized, prof Professor, the President, to, to, to explain briefly what the EU is. Uh, this, is, this, is this may be a challenge, but let me, let me try. Um, I mean, essentially, the European Union has its antecedents in the, the violent history of the continent, uh, particularly in the last century, when two European civil wars became uh, global conflagrations uh, and ended in tragedy, particularly for Europe, but also elsewhere in the world. We had the First World War, by the way, this year is the 100th anniversary of the First World War, the end of the First World War. In fact, there was no end to the First World War. There was an armistice, there was a temporary peace, and it was a temporary peace because 20 years later we started again with the Second World War. Um, and the First World War was a tragedy in terms of military casualties. The Second World War was a tragedy in terms of uh, civilian casualties. There's been no conflict where so many civilians died, and of course the Holocaust was an equal part of that. So many people during the Second World War in Europe started thinking, we need a different way of doing business on this continent. We cannot continue to allow our nationalism to uh, spill over into violent conflict. Uh, and people started to think about how to build a different kind of Europe. And what emerged is the European Union as we have it today, which is perhaps constitutionally difficult to explain because it's not a sovereign state. Uh, it is not a United States of Europe, but neither is it just an international organization or just a grouping of states. It has supranational uh, dimensions. Uh, there is a European legal order which has supremacy over national order. The European Court of Justice is effectively the Supreme Court of the European Union, which uh, and its decisions uh, are, uh, must be applied across the whole continent. And essentially, I mean, the way I like to describe it, and I will 
try to be brief, uh, is to say it's a project about peace because it was about making it inconceivable that we would ever go to war between ourselves again. And I think we have done that. 70 years since the, the end of the Second World War have basically been the longest period in, 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 in European history. You have to go back to Roman times to find an equivalent period without great power conflict on the European, the European continent. It's about freedom because it's based on democracy, the rule of law, human rights. Uh, and uh, we have been a, a beacon of uh, light for those countries emerging from totalitarianism, Greece in 1981 after the colonels, Spain and Portugal in 1986 after Salazar and Franco, and then of course the reunification of the continent after the collapse of the Berlin Wall when we brought in 10 of the countries formerly under the Soviet bloc uh, into the European Union. I don't think the European Union can claim credit for the collapse of the Berlin Wall, I do believe we can claim credit for the fact that the collapse of that wall did not result in conflict and chaos, but rather the orderly transition uh, of those newly liberated countries to Western democracies of the kind we, we see now in Central and Eastern Europe, which is a remarkable achievement. And finally, prosperity, because we built the largest, uh, one of the largest economies in the world, the European Union, at 500 million uh, consumers, is along with the US and China, one of the three foremost economies with the largest trading bloc in the world. We have a, a common currency shared by 19 of those countries, which is uh, a, the, the world's second reserve currency. But in all of this, and then this is my final point, I promise you, um, we have done this, but not in a sense of creating a sort of overarching European juggernaut that seeks to suppress uh, the identity of our nations uh, or the individuality of our nations. Your motto in the United States is a pluribus unum. Our motto is united in diversity. Uh, our, our countries want to keep their national identity. They want to keep their language. They want to keep their culture. Uh, and when you are in Denmark, you know you're in Denmark. And when you're in Portugal, you know you're in Portugal. And when you're in Latvia, you don't think you're in Italy. On the other hand, you can drive from Helsinki in Finland down to Lisbon in Portugal without having to go through customs or border checks. And you wouldn't even need to change currency unless you stopped to buy gas in Denmark. I mean, that's the reality of, of the modern Europe which we have built, which we believe is a unique blend of national identity and sovereignty with the the advantages you get from doing things together and, and cooperating, uh, the main advantage of which is that we don't, we don't fight each other. The European Union may sometimes appear boring, sometimes it is. We've driven our conflicts into conference rooms and meetings, uh, but believe me, over uh, two, 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 two world wars and the Holocaust, I'll take boring any time. Thank you. I, thank you for coming to talk with us, Your Excellency. And, <clears throat> Dakota State University is a, is a school that focuses on computer issues and uh, we produce a number of security analysts and data security people. And I think what I'd like to ask you is a few questions about Europe's sense of its own place in that computerized world that we now live in. Why don't we start with this? What, what is the European Union's sense of computer security? The computer threats posed by hackers and malicious governments. Much of the recent U.S. experience with the phenomenon came out of Eastern Europe. Has the EU felt any similar experience, and what is the EU doing to, to stop this cycle of uh, fake news and all the rest of the penetrations of you know, mildly secure institutions? Well, uh, firstly, I, I, I'm really fascinated to learn today from, from President Griffiths what you're doing in this area. I actually, because I've been dealing with this in Washington for a number of years, this issue of cybersecurity, um, and I must admit, <laughs> as a, as a non-tech specialist, I, you know, I sometimes find it hard to get my head around it. Uh, and I'm delighted to see that there's, a, there's a, an institute of higher learning that is actually focusing on this as a sort of distinct subject, which I think is, is hugely important. And maybe, in later life, I'll come back and do a graduate course, and you can you can you can explain to me some of the things I haven't understood. I mean, in Europe, I, I think, Professor, I'd like to put. I mean, you you've asked me about the fake news, and I, I don't want to dodge that question. I'll come back to it. But I think the the biggest concern about cybersecurity is is of course things like critical infrastructure, uh, things like uh, financial data, um, uh, the capacity to uh, because the, the digital. Uh, universe has become so all-pervasive that there are now vulnerabilities. And I think that the, 
the, the way in which the, the internet developed was anarchic and anti-security. Uh, it was meant to be a space where people could do their own thing. We are now realizing that actually there are also some bad people out there. I'm not just talking about the dark web, but there are also people of malevol malevolent intent uh, who would like to, sometimes just for fun, but sometimes with more ominous motives, destabilize your nuclear power station or your, your financial system or your credit card system. And these can have devastating consequences for people. So that's, I think, where our main focus at the moment is, is on the cybersecurity side of things, where we're working together as Europeans, but also in close collaboration with the US uh, on how we, how we address these, these threats and how we, how we make the, the, the internet a secure place uh, for, for our citizens, but also for our, for our nations. On the fake news issue, I mean, that's much more complex because what is happening is uh, the exploitation by certain actors, and we have every reason to believe that some of them emanate from, from, from Russia, uh, basically to exploit fault lines in our own societies. I mean, they're not making, the stuff is not as made up as we might like to believe. It may be, on, it may be false information, but it is targeted at real problems and at real, real emotions. And the purpose is destabilization. I don't even think it's, it's intended to ensure the, the victory of one or other party in an election. It simply is to destabilize and to weaken our institutions. Uh, and the strongest response to that, we believe, is actually the resilience of our own societies, transparency about what's happening, public debate, because there is no magic bullet uh, from the cyber side which will, which will insulate you from, from these kind of attacks. But this is a new phenomenon. We, we have set up in the European Union a thing which we call uh, Stratcom East, which is a, a very small, it's only about 10 or 15 people, um, team of people who actually have a website where they uh, seek to expose uh, the, these fake news and these um, activities which are designed to uh, sow dissent or to inter inter intervene in our political um, uh, process. It's been very successful, so much so that we've actually had some criticisms from within the EU that this is censorship or this is uh, interfering with um, uh, the, the freedom of expression. So which shows that I think they've been quite good at what they're doing, but it also shows that there's there's a debate about how, how much of this is, is, is fake news and how much of it is legitimate expression of opinion. Well, let's turn the question around then. If, if part of the problem that the internet age poses for us uh, is to protect data uh, from those of malicious intent, uh, what is the role of government, particularly as the EU perceives it, toward protecting privacy? Um, we used to say, the, inter the internet is a self-healing net. Every attempt to have censorship and the internet will route around it. The experience in China suggests that's perhaps not as true as it I once agree. was. Yeah. But still, in general, there is this kind of sense that you can't hide things particularly well on the net. There are places in Europe that have discovered, or at least there's agitation to, that courts should find, a right to, to be forgotten. Uh, the, the, you know, old crimes should be made to disappear if they've been sufficiently paid for uh, in some way. The United States courts have consistently refused to recognize any such right or such, you know, going back and erasing newspaper articles, for instance, or saying that newspapers cannot put them on the web. Uh, and how then does the European Union think it will deal with these kinds of issues given that the internet is so large uh, and so dominated by American companies like Google. Okay, well, let's try to unpack. You've got three or four, three or four issues in there that I'd like to just say a few words about. Um, the first is the, 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 the right of privacy. Uh, on the 25th of next month, 25th of May, uh, the European Union's new general data protection regulation. We have a great facility for making things easy and simple. Uh, <laughs> will enter into force, which is after a two-year um, period of, of implementation, of preparing for the implementation. Uh, this is the most comprehensive, uh, if you like, charter of individual data rights anywhere in the world. Uh, and by the way, I noticed that a number of people, I saw Tom Wheeler, my good friend from the FCC, just published an article in, in the New York Times 10 days ago saying that Europe was way ahead of almost all other parts of the world, particularly the developed world, in terms of this legislation. The, the, the key to this is 
to lay down in very precise terms what are our rights as individual citizens vis-a-vis -vis our data, which may be in the possession of platforms, it may be in the possession of medical professionals that we're interacting with and so forth. Uh, and this is a very comprehensive and I think uh, solid piece of work. Uh, I noticed that Facebook now in response to the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, scandal is actually proposing uh, as a sort of quick fix to say we will give to all our customers worldwide the same rights as are in the EU uh, general data protection regulation. So that's, that's one issue. We can talk more about that if, if, if you wish. Um, the, the, the second issue is uh, the, the issue of the, the right to be forgotten, uh, which is very much a minor subset of that general data protection regulation. This is not an overarching sort of principle that uh, has to be applied in all cases and all the time. It seeks to address uh, what we feel is, is a real problem, but it's, it's, it's a problem of a, of a very small proportion of data users who will find that something they did uh, in a past life, uh, you know, something that happened, maybe they were the, the victim of child abuse uh, at a school when they were a teenager, and this got into a newspaper somewhere. They are now a distinguished brain surgeon. But when you Google them, what comes up first is the fact that they were the victim of child abuse as a, as a teenager. Is that what should define their life? Now, the, I, the, I want to be very clear. There is no right to erase it from the newspaper. There is no right to erase it from the website of the newspaper. If you go into the archives of the newspaper, if it was published in the newspaper, it could come up on the archive. When you go into a search engine, looking for general information about the person, there is a case for saying that that should not pop up as the most important thing that ever happened to them in their life when they've moved on and, and done many other things. There's the issue of revenge porn, which is, is frequently a, a problem. So these are specific situations. The rules are very clear. As an individual, if you feel you want to apply this, you have to specify what the issue is. You have to go to your national data protection authority in, within the EU. They have to validate it and say, this is legitimate. So it's, it can't be a frivolous request. It has to be documented. They have to validate. And at that point, it will be passed to one of the search engines to say, we would like you to take this down from being on the first page of the search. It does not remove the, 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 the base material, it doesn't change the court records. If, 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 if unfortunately, say the, the victim's name was mentioned in, in, in the, the court, in the, which is not usually the case now, but certainly 10 or 15 years ago was sometimes the case. It does not remove the, the source material, but it just means that you're, you're, when your name is put into the search engine, this will not come up as the, as the, first, as the, first, as the first item. It does not apply an important exception to public figures, to, to, to people like myself. I have no right to apply for anything uh, I've done in my professional life. Uh, I cannot say, well, I made a mistake 10 years ago and I'd like that to, to disappear from the search engine. Uh, and it does not apply to politicians. It does not apply to, to uh, uh, people in the public who are deemed to be, you know, whose life is out there in the public domain in, in a sort of uh, obvious way. So it's, you know, and I, we, we, you count literally in terms of in a year, there may be a couple of hundred of requests of this kind. So I think this is something which, yes, it's an issue, but it needs to be put in its correct context. It's not a blanket attempt to have censorship or to manipulate the result of search, search engines. It's dealing with some specific, well-defined cases, uh, and it has to be well-documented, and if, if justified, yes, you can make, make that application. So I, I think um, the, the, then there's the question of how all of this links to, to the U.S., uh, you, unfortunately, in this country do not have, I say unfortunately, because I, I think it's a, it's a mistake, you don't have a, an overarching uh, privacy legislation. You have uh, sectoral uh, privacy legislation, you have rights of privacy in specific situations, but you don't have an overarching. I think in the modern age, that's a, that's mis, that's a missing piece in your, in your, your rights for, for, for people, but that's you know, your choice. We, in terms of how U.S. companies uh, interact with this, it's very clear that U.S. companies who wish to operate in the European space, in the EU space, and that's, you know, the largest market in the world, uh, is uh, they have to respect European legislation. Um, 
And I note that, by the way, I quoted the Facebook example, but Facebook is not the only one. I think more and more American companies are going to find it just since they have to apply the European rules, they might as well apply them everywhere rather than sort of having a Chinese wall between what they do for their European customers and what they do for their American customers. So I think uh, there will be some collateral benefit uh, for citizens in the US to what American companies will do to adapt to the, the rights granted under the European legislation. Or collateral damage. I mean, one, the question is which way this turns. Um, but the, do you have an example right, of the damage? I beg your pardon? Do you have an example of the damage? Well, one of the first cases that made the American newspapers a few years ago of the right to be forgotten was about a British politician. Uh, okay, but it doesn't apply. Right, but it was, you know, this yeah, was one of the right. first attempts to try and deploy yeah. this, this procedure. Um, however small the right to be forgotten might seem from the global perspective of privacy, uh, it's nonetheless a meaningful synecdoche for the differences between the United States and the European Union, most locused around the First Amendment yeah. and freedom of speech. Uh, and the kind of, you know, to an American court operating under the First Amendment, the right to be forgotten looks like a metaphysical nullity. You were trying to change the past. Uh, now, that's, that's not how it appears, not coming from this perspective. Uh, but let me try another take on this. There was a case that came out of Switzerland perhaps a year ago of someone who was charged with a hate crime or under hate crime statutes, which looked to Americans like blasphemy crimes uh, for clicking like on a Facebook page. The Facebook page was such, the owner of the Facebook page was subsequently charged as well. But this person was charged with committing a hate crime for clicking like, solely for the act of clicking like on a Facebook page. The question of what constitutes hate speech uh, and the question of what role a government has in regulating all that uh, strikes me as a major divide, and a major divide exacerbated by the fact that as we've already noted, the internet is international. It doesn't respect national boundaries, but leaps across them. I mean, I think you, you put your finger, Professor, on the, the, the key difference, which is the First Amendment and the interpretation. I mean, we have, indeed, it is illegal. And I think we need, it's very important to say, we have laws in Europe that prevent hate speech, that prevent Holocaust denial, let's say. Now, you forgive me, we take a different view of these things than you do. The Holocaust didn't happen in America, it happened in Europe. And we know how we got there, by tolerating certain kinds of discourse and permitting people to say whatever they want in public. Uh, that isn't, we, we've been there, and we're not gonna let that happen again. So we have the right, and we, we do that, we make illegal the expression of certain types of hate or, or uh, incitement to violence. And these are illegal. So in the Facebook case, I'm not familiar with it, but from what you say, yeah, if someone clicks like on something which is inciting to do something illegal, well, sorry, prima facie, that's, that's associating themselves with a crime. And, and the debate we have with the, the platforms is we want them to take down stuff which is illegal in Europe. If it's illegal to produce it on a photocopier in your garage, it should be illegal to have it on the web. If you try to print it in a newspaper, you would be sent to jail. Why should you then be free to put that same stuff up on the web? We don't see a distinction between these two spaces. So if it's illegal, and, and I emphasize, we're talking about what's, what's legal. It's not, it's, not an, it's not an opinion. It's not, I have, you don't have a censorship board that says, oh, I like this, I don't like that. We have set into law certain things. You may disagree with the fact that we have done that, but I think our historical experience uh, teaches us that if we don't have these rules in Europe, certain things can happen, uh, and, and we don't want to go back to that space again. And, and I think I actually agree with you personally, but let me push this one more step, just so we can see. The European Union, by imposing these rules on Google, as it operates in Europe, say, essentially creates a situation in which Google has an incentive, a strong incentive, to apply these rules across the board in every nation. Uh, if nothing else, it's a technological reason for keeping yes. the, the simplicity of the platform and all the rest. How then, as it imposes its will on American companies operating across the world, uh, through its power to regulate the market in, in its own area, how then is what the European Union is doing different from what, say, China is doing, 
when China wishes to control data. Now, China has, of course, essentially created its own Google, its yeah. own internet search engine. But China would like very much to be in that position where it can ban talk of a certain kind, not just in China, but elsewhere. Uh, in effect, that seems to be what the European Union is doing. No, not at all. Um, I mean, China is a totalitarian uh, one-party state. Uh, the difference is that China, when China, China's actions are designed exclusively to keep the, that party in power. That's the motivation and that's what they're doing. And as you say, they've created the, the great firewall of China, contrary to what we all thought was possible. They have proved you can actually have internet in one country, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, in Europe, we are talking simply about situations in which certain things which are illegal uh, uh, in everyday life in Europe cannot be exempt from the rule of law on the internet. That's all we're saying. We're just saying you can't, you can't escape uh, from, from the, the constraints which we, our democratically elected governments have decided to put in place to protect our citizens in the way that we see fit. And you cannot tell me that, well, sorry, that doesn't apply to Google because Google's an American company or Google is an international company. Sorry, it applies to them to the extent that their product is available in, on our territory and then we will not accept that illegal material is promulgated by a search engine or by a platform uh, uh, through, 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 through the internet. And I don't, I mean, I, I don't think, we probably don't disagree. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. It is open to abuse, yes. But the difference is we are democracies with the rule of law. We have constitutions, we have courts. Uh, and our process is open and transparent, and if someone thinks governments have done too, gone too far, they can take the government to court and there will be a, ju there will be a judge that will, will adjudicate. So I think that's a very different situation to, to, to what you have in China. But one presumes, um, you know, laissez majeste is a crime in Saudi Arabia, a legal crime of, of some real weight. Uh, how then does Saudi Arabia's laws matter less to the world community than the European unions. I mean, why do you get to say our laws are good, but other countries' laws aren't? But you would you would draw the same conclusion, I think. Well, as, I, as the United I, you know, States, I think one would, ought to be able to mock the king of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, just as I think one ought to. You know, as an American, I feel deep in my blood somewhere the First Amendment. Uh, but I, I'm asking more a kind of philosophical question about is it simply the size of this market which you've described as the European Union, so enormous, so important to the world economy, and this is how you began your remarks, is it that alone that says our laws against hate crimes have, for instance, have a kind of force in the world that Saudi Arabia's laws against laissez majeste or North Korea's laws against insulting the great leader, uh, that these laws don't have? I, I, could, I could make a, a comment about the extraterritorial application of laws and say that America doesn't hesitate from time to time to project extraterritorially its laws. Fair enough. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a, a difficult discussion that, you know, you, you have a huge weight in the global economy as well. Uh, I think you are right. The reason why people pay attention to what is happening in the European Union is because it's, it affects a massive market. And for Google to say, well, actually, we'd rather not be in that market and preserve our First Amendment principles uh, doesn't make a lot of economic sense for them. I, that's a choice they make. Uh, but I think, you know, you can't blame us. Uh, I repeat, we are democracies. Uh, we have the rule of law. And we have, uh, we believe it is important to make certain kinds of behavior or speech Ill illegal because of our history. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a bitter and deep history. Uh, and we will not allow that to be circumvented by an internet system that is, is, is without in a space in which uh, the rule of law cannot apply. And we're not going to allow people to put up on, on, on Facebook or on Google or on, on, on other platforms uh, uh, things denying the Holocaust, inciting people to Islamophobia uh, or homophobia or, or, or whatever, uh, uh, or inciting people to violence in, in Catalonia or, or in Northern Ireland. Uh, no, we're not going to allow that. Uh, we don't allow it in newspapers, we don't allow it in books, and we're not going to allow it on the web. Let's talk for a second about 
access, because there's a, there's a very curious divide that's emerging here in the United States, and I wonder if it's matched in your experience in Europe, <clears throat> between um, state bureaucracies, governmental bureaucracies, governmental legislatures, and so on, that see um, a desire to spread the internet and computer usage to areas that have been traditionally lagging, the poor, uh, rural areas, and so on. Uh, at the same time, many writers and psychologists who are studying this are growing increasingly worried about the effect on young minds and developmental processes of watching this much, having this much computer time. Uh, and a very curious divide has emerged now, a digital divide, in which, in fact, the rich and the upper middle class spend less time online than the poor. Uh, the poor are now spending, the poor minority groups in the United States are spending around 11 hours a day staring at a screen. Their phones, their computers, television. Uh, is this divide in which sort of one part of the world, one part of, of the culture is pushing computer use all across the board, and another part of the culture is pointing out that in fact, it's the poor who are suffering most from the computers. Uh, is this paralleled in the European experience? I, I haven't heard the debate in quite those terms. I'm, I'm looking at my wife because when we were bringing up our two kids who are now 27 and 24, uh, we used to have this debate <laughs> about how much, how much screen time they got. My wife was uh, definitely a screen skeptic and uh, wanted to limit it very severely. Uh, uh, I was a bit more relaxed about it, saying, oh, well, you know, they will learn skills that will be very useful to them in the future. Of course, it also meant they bothered me less. But um, <laughs> um, I, I think it's a very, it's a very valid question. I, I certainly have not heard it addressed at a policy level in Europe. We're still at the level of the debate that you, the first part you mentioned, which is trying to ensure equal access to, to digital services, particularly in rural areas, for example. The penetration of broadband into, into less populated areas is, is a big policy objective in Europe so that people there are, don't feel deprived of the benefits of access to the net. And of course, yes, all our governments are moving towards e-government uh, portals and, and more and more of your interaction with the government is going to be done through uh, uh, the, the internet uh, and online experience rather than through paper and, and, and offices. Uh, the more general point you make, yes, I'm, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's an issue. I, I don't, but I, I, you know, I have not. Honestly, I've never heard it. Uh, it possibly is debated, but I personally have not come across that that debate. Uh, the, the, the the issue of the social divide uh, and the the, the 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 rise of inequality is, I think, and and this is to a certain extent part of that. Uh, uh, is, is a big issue in Europe. I mean, I think the Gini coefficient, the, the inequality coefficient, is, is more favorable in Europe than it is here, but we still have a problem. And, and, and it is also reflected in, in some of the populist movements that you see, the disillusionment with traditional politics. We also are having this, this experience of, of, and the financial crisis has, has perhaps accentuated uh, income inequality and divisions in society, and I think people are very actively thinking, how can we address this? Because if we don't address it fairly quickly, uh, we could see the, the you know, many political problems coming down the road. But in terms of the digital and the amount of time people spend on the screen relative to their income, I, I haven't even seen, there probably are statistics, but I haven't seen them. Right. It's just a curious phenomenon in yeah. which we have the government working to end a digital divide, when in fact it's the poor who are online more than the rich that the rich can afford to separate themselves from the web. But maybe the, I, mean, I, suspect, I suspect the poor are not online kind of filling in their, their sort of uh, tax reforms, no. uh, tax returns. I, I, you it know, does, as you describe the, the attempt to increase digital access, that raises a question that's near and dear to, to President Griffiths, to others here, which is, are you trying to, to expand 3G and 4G access? Or is the, the sense that we need to move to the 5G, the greater, the new, the new kind of access? Because you know, we, we see that debate here in this country. There, there is competing legislation in the United States Congress and Senate right now, one of which says 
we need to take the existing 3G and 4G networks and spread them out across the rural areas. The other says we need to skip over all that old technology and jump straight to the newest one. And it's ridiculous to build infrastructure across the rural to areas that's going to be superseded in a couple years. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue of, of 5G is, is, a, is a very lively debate in Europe. I mean, we are, we actually, I, I, many of our specialists that say that we're actually behind, certainly behind relative to Japan and, and say Korea, who've been, been, I mean, Europe gained a huge benefit in the, 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 the mobile telephony uh, world with the GSM, uh, but we have slipped far behind since then. Uh, and 5G is seen as, as, as a way forward. We're having huge problems uh, about spectrum, uh, about radio spectrum, and, and this is a terrible problem between our different member states because people use different spectrums for different things and trying to get agreement on allocating the necessary spectrum between 28 countries, between some of whom use it for military purposes and, and, and um, emergency communication purposes and trying to, trying to harmonize <coughs> that and get an agreed sort of European 5G spectrum is what is holding things up. The, the other work is going on, but that is, the, is what's gonna slow down the, the rollout and, and people, some, some business people I've spoken in Europe are seriously worried that we're falling too far behind. Um, but the debate, I mean, the, the, the debate about spreading the, the existing technology, it's, it's still pretty much what people are doing uh, because it's mainly putting fiber optic cable out to, to rural areas and, and that's, most countries have still got plans to continue with that direction because I think if you wait for the 5G, it's, it's felt to be, it's going to be too late or, or take too long. Sure. What about supercomputing? Uh, last year, the Chinese, there was a brief moment where China had the largest number of multi-mega flops of supercomputing in the world. And there was a time in which that would have been inconceivable. The United States and Europe were simply so far ahead in supercomputing that it, you know, it looked like no one else should bother to compete with them. Uh, now the United States with, with the new computers, I think in Oak Ridge and elsewhere, the United States has nosed ahead of China. but. Uh, what is the sense of the European Union on the, the investment in supercomputing and this kind of, you know, we've moved off of the microcomputer now to the highest end of computing? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem for, for within Europe is that we don't have, you know, the, all of this is not dealt with on a continental scale in, in the way that you tend to deal with it here in the United States. A lot of this is still sort of national research projects or whatever, and we don't have the mega companies that you have here uh, who are who are you know investing the kind of money. So I, I think this is an area where, frankly, I don't. I mean, there are people active in the area, but I don't think we regard ourselves as really competing with yourselves and, and the Chinese on this. I think, I think we, we are concerned about what is happening in China. I, I'm even more concerned about artificial intelligence where I think they, they, the Chinese are probably ahead of the field at this point, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly. Um, and it's not that I resent the fact that China would be technologically powerful, it's given their government and the nature of their government and the, the objective of, of that regime, which is, let's face it, not a benevolent objective. I'm not saying it's, it's a malevolent objective, but it's not a benevolent, they're not doing it to, uh, to make the world a better place, they're, they're doing it to secure supremacy for, for, for their country. Uh, I, I think we should be somewhat concerned. Um, but in Europe, I mean, I think we are, um, really trying to sort of look to the next generation of these activities. I mean, our big problem is we have not grown uh, big tech companies. There's a lot of very, very talented startup all over Europe. Uh, but the, frankly, I mean, a bit like I, I noticed, by the way, I was reading something by Google the other day, and I hadn't realized that the two founders tried to sell it at one point for a million dollars, and they couldn't get a million dollars, and someone drove them down to 750,000. This was in like 99 or, and they, 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 they reluctantly decided they couldn't sell for 750,000, but they would have sold for a million. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like the, like, like, like the guy who didn't sign the Beatles, you know, you kind of thing. Um, so our, our companies tend to sell, our startups tend to sell out when they get to 25, 30 million, they basically sell out to frequently to big American companies because there isn't, we don't have the capital market, the liquidity of capital markets in Europe to allow companies like that to grow. And that's one of the things we're working on is to try and uh, reduce the amount of 
the dependency which European companies have on banks. European companies depend to 70% on bank loans, 30% liquid. Here it's the opposite, 70% liquid, 30% banks. We need to, in Europe, we need to get to something closer to 50-50 so that we could have the capital to grow the companies who could then be making the investment in, in these kind of moonshot uh, technologies of supercomputers or whatever. Well, and you went straight to artificial intelligence, which of course was where I was going from a supercomputer <laughs> question. I know there are reports in the Asian version of the Wall Street Journal, the Asian edition of the Wall Street Journal, there are reports that suggest the Red Army Fund and the Communist Party leadership are the single largest investors in yeah. artificial intelligence in the world, yeah. which you know is a sort of when the Red Army Fund is one of the largest, you know, uh, pension fund is one of the is maybe the largest investor in something. It makes gives one pause, uh, but uh, what is is there in place any kind of thought, working group, pending legislation to deal with the changes that artificial intelligence has run through neural networks uh, and this new way of thinking about artificial intelligence. You know, we used to read 1950s science fiction and it was all about when uh, it was going, artificial intelligence was going to wake up and become self-conscious and then Skynet was going to rain hell down on all of us. Uh, it's but, all, in, all in space odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow, you know, the new, whole system of neural networks and training and pattern recognition uh, breaks down those old 1950s sci-fi distinctions between things like weak AI and strong AI. It doesn't matter if the artificial intelligence is actually self-conscious, it'll fake it uh, sufficiently that we can't tell the difference. And then invest in markets. Uh, everything begins to change if that becomes possible. Is there something in the European Union that we don't really have here in the United States, which is, you know, a, a, a officially sponsored group who are thinking about how to address with law and policy these changes that are going to come? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. I, I think people are waking up to the fact that this is, a, this is a serious issue. I mean, as you know, there are conflicting debates. I mean, there are people who tell us we should be terrified of it. You know, I, I read a book recently called um, The Last Invention, which said basically <laughs> Artificial intelligence is the last thing humans will ever invent because it'll all be invented by artificial intelligence thereafter. Sure. Uh, and there are those who say, no, be, be more relaxed. You know, people have feared technological advances down through the years. They all, you know, from the from the sort of spinning machine to 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 the automobile, people have seen it as as threatening technology, and it's always turned out to be more beneficial than than dangerous. Uh, uh, I, I frankly, I don't know where I come out. I I I, I think there are probably some some very real issues here. Uh, about artificial intelligence and, and, and the impl its implications. I suspect the problems are perhaps not as great as, as some people present them, uh, and it probably is more manageable than, than, than some people want to say, but, um, and to the Chinese point, I agree with you, I think. Uh, I mean, again, I never know to what extent we are over imbuing the Chinese with qualities, you know, just as during the Cold War, we, I mean, remember Sputnik? And people thought, my goodness, the Soviets, you know, are taking over the world just because they'd put, you know, one little satellite into, into orbit. You then went on to put men on the moon in, in 1969 as a response to that. Uh, and you won the technological race with Russia hands down uh, to the point where you bankrupted them in, in, in the 80s. So I think we need to be a little bit cautious about overreacting to some of this stuff. But I think there are some very real issues. And to my knowledge, in Europe, we're not yet at the point of really thinking through how we would deal with those. Well, it's a general rule of technological uh, advancement is that it happens in a kind of libertarian way. It's from the roots up. And things just happen. And then we react to it by legislation. So this, for instance, the Cambridge Analytica stuff, which is, you know, and, and the mining of Facebook for data, which the Obama campaign did uh, to great acclaim, in fact, uh, in, you know, four years ago or more, <coughs> and now the, the Trump campaign apparently did, it, that everybody's, there's a long sense of many people doing this. The, the scandal has at least done this much. It's awoken many people to realize how much data about themselves they are trailing. Uh, and they've exposed to uh, large entities. The one study was recently released that suggests that if you have Gmail, unless you automatically have a Google account, uh, you're trailing somewhere around an encyclopedia's worth of information 
about you. Old emails, deleted emails, uh, you use Google Maps, Google keeps a record of where you've gone. Also, they can direct advertising at you. Uh, and only now are people awakening to it. I think, isn't this the pattern, though, that we're going to see kind of over and over again in the computer revolution, that it's only really somewhere down the road that we awaken to the problems? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think some people in Europe woke to this very early. I mean, the guy, you, you may be aware that one of the um, pieces of legislation that enables the flow of data between the EU and the US is something which we now call the privacy shield, uh, but it was previously called safe harbor. Uh, and it was struck down by a European Court of Justice judgment uh, in 2015. Um, and um, that was on the basis of a case taken by a young Austrian lawyer called Max Schrems. And by the way, if you're interested, there's a very interesting interview with him in, the, in this week's Financial Times. If you Google it, I would, if you're interested in this stuff, I really would recommend. I mean, I've met Mr. Schrems. And I, you know, we're not supposed to be on, on good terms because he attacked basically the institution <laughs> for which I work and he took us to court and he won. But he actually, back in 2000 and, and, and sort of eight or nine, actually wrote to Facebook and said, what information do you have on me? And they sent him back uh, 1,200 pages of data and he was shocked. And then he got involved in talking to, he went to the Irish, uh, because Facebook uh, Europe is based in Ireland, he went to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner and said, listen, do you have you any idea about the information these people are holding on me, on, on me and therefore on everybody else? The Irish Data Protection Commissioner looked at it, didn't find there was a problem, Schrems was not happy, and he went to court, and eventually he struck down, uh, or had struck down, the legislation that permitted the flow of data, personal data, from Europe to, 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 the, e, to, the, to, to the US. So this was a kind of visionary guy, in fairness to him, who spotted this problem, uh, you know, many, many years ago. So I, I think some people have spotted it. I think, frankly, the rest of us have been a bit complacent because we tend to think, yeah, that's, that's the price of being able to use Facebook. Uh, what I don't think we realized, I mean, I think we accepted that a certain amount of data was going to these companies. I don't think we realized the extent to which that could then be mined and used in, in the way that we now understand it. And I think this is why you're getting a, a pushback. And that's why, as I say, I think Facebook are now, now announced they're going to apply the European data protection rules to all their customers. There's going to be a new system whereby you can opt in and out more. Because one of the things about the general data protection regulation, it, it puts a great insistence on the um, positive consent by the data owner on the use of their material. And they, it, it says that the companies must uh, do this in a user-friendly way, not, not the way now when you, you know, you're trying to do something and you get an app that comes up and says, you know, do you consent to the terms and conditions, you know, yes, or click here to read, and when you click here to read, you get kind of 50 pages of legal text, and so you go back and you just say, okay, yes, whatever. Uh, now they're going to have to be much more explicit about what you are actually agreeing to, to make available. Uh, and by the way, the reason why I think this general data protection regulation will make a huge difference is there's a potential for, sh for, for fines and massive fines. Now, I don't think anyone wants to fine companies. That's not, it's not a revenue collecting measure, but it's focusing the minds of the companies because their lawyers are saying, hey, if you're, if you're not respecting this legislation, you could get fined. Mm -hmm. And that's changing dramatically the dynamic because the dynamic was all about monetizing the data uh, of people who were getting a free service, whether that was Google or, or Facebook or whatever. But if companies now realize that there could actually be a, a monetary cost to them of getting that wrong, I think you're going to see a, a, a big change of, of behavior in terms of the transparency of the data, uh, the, the consent you give for the use of, of data uh, through, through the, these, these platforms or that you're, you're a party to. Now, not all of the faculty here and students are in digital topics. It turns out there are a handful of us who <laughs> wander around in other fields. And there's some questions that they wanted to ask. Um, one of which was, what's the sense of the European Union about Russia, particularly in the wake of the accusations of the recent assassination attempts in England? Um, and, you know, how is how is the malevolence or neutrality, or how does one want to describe Russia, uh, Russia's position relative to the European Union? Well, I mean, this is a, a hugely important question for us because Russia is our sort of largest neighbor, if you like. I mean, uh, 
Um, it's 110 million people. It stretches from uh, the sort of, you know, uh, Eastern Europe to through to the Pacific. Uh, it's it's a country with whom we have deep connections. Uh, Russian culture, Russian literature, Russian language. Um, we should never forget when we talk about the Second World War. It's kind of you know it's been sort of uh, I would say sort of covered up a bit, but. We couldn't have won the Second World War without, without the Soviet Union. I mean, 20 million, 20 million Russians died in the Second World War. Now, by the way, they partly contributed to the start of it with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which actually enabled them to start. They invaded Poland at the same time as Hitler did. So they have, I mean, they're not completely innocent in this, but still. So we have these deep connections with Russia. And when the, the Berlin Wall collapsed and the Soviet Union collapsed, most people in Europe were full of optimism that with the collapse of this sort of, you know, unsustainable uh, communist uh, totalitarianism with the newfound freedom for the Baltic countries, for the, for the countries of, you know, Poland, Hungary, and Romania, Bulgaria, Czech, Czechia, and, and Slovakia, and, and the rest, uh, that this would herald a new era in Europe of cooperation, of friendship, and we really thought we were on track to having a really good relationship with a Russia which would evolve in a, in a positive way, develop its economy, uh, diversify, uh, offer a better standard of living to its people, and be a partner, and that was the, that was the track we thought we were launched mm -hmm. on. Enter Mr. Putin, uh, enter, you know, the attack on the, the, in 2008, the military intervention in Georgia, and then, of course, the uh, annexation of Crimea, which was the first time uh, in, in, in Europe since the Helsinki agreements in the 1970s were signed at the height of the Cold War in order to stabilize the security architecture uh, in Europe is the first time that uh, a country had changed a frontier by force. And this is a dramatic change. Uh, and this has dramatically changed the way we look at Russia and the way we interact with Russia. And we are extremely concerned by the behavior of Mr. Putin, uh, by the way in which he has behaved, it, not only in annexing Crimea, in, in, in the eastern provinces of, of Ukraine, where these little green men, whom we all know are, are Russian soldiers, but pretending not to be, uh, are exploiting uh, uh, ethnic tensions in eastern Ukraine, destabilizing Ukraine, basically denying Ukraine the right to exercise its own sovereignty. Uh, they are behaving in similar way across other countries in, in, that, in that area. Uh, and, uh, you know, posing a massive challenge, uh, and most recently, of course, with, with the assassination attempt. So this, you know, we have to push back very strongly uh, on these. That's why we have the sanctions against Russia. We will continue to maintain those sanctions as long as they misbehave in Ukraine. We've got new sanctions now and expulsion of diplomats. We have to push back against what Putin is doing, but I want to emphasize at the same time, we, we, this is not where we want to be with Russia. We do not want a new Cold War. We do not want uh, uh, to go back into a confrontation and an isolation of Russia. But unfortunately, it's where Mr. Putin and his policies are taking us at the present time. But we will still try to maintain uh, an element of dialogue, an element of discussion, because we have to keep the, the door open for having a better relationship in, in, in due course. What about the Baltic countries? Because they feel particularly threatened, Indeed. I think. Uh, and uh, certainly militarily, there's, if Russia wishes to take them over militarily, there's no way to stop Russia. Uh, well, there is. How so? Well, I mean, one should not, I mean, it would be a mistake to think that the Russian military are not that powerful. The Russian military forces are actually quite degraded. So, I mean, I think if it came to a conventional war in Europe, uh, Russia would not win it, with on current on current balance of balance of power. Right, uh, but and, and if if Russia were to, I mean, given that the Baltic states are are part of NATO and the the, the Article Five commitment of co belligerency applies, if there were an attack on the on the Baltic states, it would be considered an attack on all of us, uh, and and the, and and it would trigger a major armed conflict, which, in my view, the Russians would lose. Uh, so, I mean. We just need to be clear about that. I mean, the, the sort of implication, oh, they could just take the Baltic states and nothing we can do about it. We will. That, would be, that is a red line that will not be crossed, or if crossed, will produce a major military confrontation. Well, let's speak about NATO for a moment then. What about Turkey and the Turkish situation now? Because Turkey is also, of course, involved in this. What, uh, and there are tensions between Turkey and Greece. 
Uh, Turkey is certainly going after the Kurds outside of its own borders. I mean, what is the sense of Turkey as, um, you know, used years ago it was common to call Turkey the sick man of Europe, or the Ottoman Empire, mm. the sick yes. man of Europe. The interesting part of that, of course, is of Europe, uh, that part of the phrase. Uh, and what is the sense of Turkey in its relation to the EU, in its uh, participation in NATO? I mean, what's the sense that, that you have um, speaking, you know, on behalf of a relatively unified Europe? Well, I mean, Turkey is another... <laughs> Kind of special case uh, because it's a it's it's a hugely important partner. It's 80 million people. Uh, it's it straddles Europe and Asia. I mean, more of Turkey is in Asia than is in than is in Europe. But it's it's a country with whom we have strong ties. There are many Turkish people who live uh, all over Europe. There are three million Turks alone living in in Germany. Germany. Um, uh, and it's an important NATO partner. It's the largest army in NATO, actually. Uh, uh, and it is a strategically a very important partner. At the same time, we're not very comfortable with the direction in which Turkey is moving in terms of uh, media, freedom of expression, political rights, uh, journalistic rights, uh, human rights. I'm afraid after the coup, which we all condemned and which rightly so, there should never have been a coup against Erdogan, but uh, the reaction of that has been to take repressive steps, which we feel, put more distance between Europe, uh, between Turkey and the European Union and the values of the European Union as we understand it and make much more difficult the idea of Turkey eventually joining the European Union. And I think while it is officially a candidate and we are negotiating, I think uh, the direction in which Mr. Erdogan is moving the country makes it less and less likely that Turkey would be able to join the European Union uh, any time in, in the near future. At the same time, we do not want a rupture with Turkey. We want to maintain a, a good relationship because it's it's an important part of our of our of our region. You see, if I may, this is a big difference between you and us. Okay, you've got Canada to the north of you, and I understand you feel very threatened by that. That would that would scare me too. And you've got Mexico to the south. But for the rest, I mean, you're kind of you're this continent which is pretty far away from anywhere. We live in an extremely dangerous neighborhood. I mean, we have Mr. Putin to the east, we have Turkey, the arc of instability, the war in Syria. The war in Syria, which is the, the greatest humanitarian catastrophe of our generation, uh, continues to generate negative consequences for us. You saw it in the refugee crisis. So when people in America talk about these things, it's a kind of academic discussion. For us, it's, it's our neighborhood. It has immediate impact on, 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 our, on our citizens' daily lives. Down through uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, into uh, North Africa, uh, the instability uh, in Libya. This is what we as Europeans are trying to deal with. Uh, and mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out what is the mix between incentive, cooperation, and pushback, and, and, and you know, strength. And it's a very difficult mix to get, to, to get right on, 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 in any given situation. But you know, we live in this very charged environment, and we're very conscious of that these foreign policy decisions or security decisions really have immediate and direct consequences for our immediate security. If I take the Iran deal, uh, the issue of nuclear weapons in Iran, we, one of the reasons we Europeans are so attached to that deal is that if Iran were to acquire nuclear weapons, that has an immediate impact on Europe's national security in a way it'll never have on yours. So for you, it can be a sort of slightly theoretical debate for some of this stuff. For us, it's got very immediate and tangible consequences on a daily basis. And that's why sometimes maybe we approach these things slightly differently. Well, I think they wanted to wrap up here shortly, but maybe we could ask one last question, which is, how have you found the United States? I mean, what's your takeaway after this time? Well, no, I, look, I'm a big fan of this country. I, I, I came here uh, when I was a child at nine years of age in, in 1961. I came from Dublin, uh, and Ireland was a pretty poor country in the 1960s. And I always say it's like that Technicolor moment. I moved from Dublin to California. It's like that moment in The Wizard of Oz when the, when the movie turns from black and white to color, you know? And, and I have remained a, a huge fan of this country. I think it's a great country. I'm not sure it's the greatest country in the world, but it's a great country. Uh, it's got so much to offer. It's achieved so much. Uh, and I find the people are wonderful. I think I, the American people, I'm a, an unabashed fan of the, the generosity of spirit, the ingenuity, the friendship. So I'm, I'm a big fan. 
But yes, we have some disagreements, and there are, there are things we don't, we don't always see eye to eye on, and, and we'll try to manage those. But I do believe, fundamentally for me, uh, the European Union and the United States are each other's best partners. As Vice President Joe Biden said at the Munich Security Conference a few years ago, you know, we are each other's first friends, best friends of first resort. When there's a problem, who do people in Washington call? They end up calling European capitals. When we have a problem, who do we call first? We call Washington. And I think that just sums it up. So whatever differences we may have, what binds us together is far more important. Czesław Miłosz, the Polish poet, spent some time in California and wrote about it, and he called it the end of Western civilization. And he meant it in both senses. This is the target and the goal at which all of Western civilization has been heading <laughs> all the time. These beautiful women and this beautiful scenery and all the rest of it. And also, of course, the end in the sense of the terminus. This is where you know, the, the, the world of education and European intellectualism in which he was brought up kind of comes to an end and fritters out. Uh, and that dualism is something one notices over and over again with Europeans visiting this country, the sense of somehow this is a fulfillment and also a washing away of the European vision that comes out of the 18th century uh, and the 19th century of liberalism and learning and the rest of it. I wondered if that's where you were going when you mentioned California. No, I was. I would just. I mean, you know, in the East Coast West Coast debate, I'm much more West Coast than East Coast. I'm, I'm a big <laughs> fan of the West Coast. I, 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 I'm a big fan of the West. Actually, I, 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 uh, I find Western America so invigorating. Uh, just maybe it's the sort of frontier spirit, uh, um, the openness, the the scenery, the the, the expanse. I, I find that very very appealing. I'm I'm less comfortable in sort of New England or Boston or New York. I mean, I still like them. Don't get me wrong; they're great cities. But um, no, I wasn't I wasn't implying that at all. I mean, I I think uh, I think America, you know, the ideas which founded this country were European ideas. Uh, you didn't invent. Uh, you know, the concept of the rights of man and all that. These were ideas you brought from Europe because we couldn't put them into practice in Europe because of our, our, our uh, uh, ossified uh, systems of, of monarchy and religion. Uh, and and we, were, we were kind of trying to fight our own way out of that and it took us several hundred years to do it. You were able to bring those ideas over almost like seedlings and plant them here in a new country and grow them and develop them in your own way. And to a certain extent, some of those ideas we kind of imported back, like, like you helped us with the famous uh, disease of the, of, the, um, of the vines, you know, when, <laughs> when, when they were wiped out all over Europe because of the disease. And we took the vines that you brought from Europe and planted them here. You, you then went to California, brought them and pl replanted them back, back in Europe. And that's, to me, intellectually, that's the way the exchange ha has gone. And I think that's hugely uh, interesting as a, as a, as a concept. Uh, and I don't, but I don't think that you represent the sort of ultimate achievement of European civilization. I think Europe is actually achieving its own civilization back in Europe very well, thank you. But you're, you're developing your own civilization, and I'm, 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 a big, I'm a big admirer of it, and, and I think the two are very complementary. Well, it's a, it's a wonder and, and a joy to have a you know, European diplomat who sort of knows the United States. Uh, the story is told that when, in the late 40s, maybe early 50s, uh, Jean Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir took the boat over yeah. and were met in Boston Harbor by the American writer Mary McCarthy. And it was like September, October. And to take them down to New York, she drove west first through western Massachusetts to see the foliage at its peak, yeah. all those red and yellow leaves. And they grew in the little white churches and all the rest of New England. And they grew more and more silent with her and then they by the end they accused her of setting up Potemkin villages for her for, for them to visit on the grounds that they knew the United States was the canyons of New York skyscrapers Indian reservations and Las Vegas <laughs> and, and that, that was the whole of the United States because you know they'd grown up reading Karl May westerns and this was the the whole extent of their right. knowledge uh, and so we're kind of, again, just as Miwash had this dualism, we're sort of used to Europeans of a certain intellectual stature coming over and saying, where are the Red Indians? Uh, whereas in a Karl May novel, they, they, they are watching, Ni they're at Niagara Falls, they ride for five hours and they're in the desert. Uh, and there's a sort of sense of, you know, this, the United States is something wild and strange and new. I, you know, I, I, the only thing I can tell you is that 
it's kind of routine for most Europeans now to spend, you know, a good part of their time in the in the U.S. at some point in their in their life, either mm -hmm. as university students or when they're older. Most people have traveled here. Uh, I think most people have. I mean, okay, this is a vast country. I mean, one of the things we do as Europeans is we underestimate the diversity of this country. Right. You're right. We tend to think it's it's New York or it's Los Angeles, but we we underestimate that South Dakota has a very distinct personality and character, which is different, you know, even from North Dakota uh, or, or or even from Wyoming. Not to mention uh, Texas or, or or Vermont or or or. or or California. So, yeah, I don't think that every European grasps the full diversity of this country, but I, th I think people know this country quite well and, 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 and are exposed to American literature, to American music, American movies, American TV series. I mean, TVs are inundated with them. Uh, some, of them some of them are very good, that's okay. Um, but, so I think, I think most, most Europeans do actually understand America quite well. But, that it's, it's a distinct country and many of them would like to come and live here, but many would not. And, and you know, I, I repeat, you know, I think Europe is developing its own space of, of one of the best places to live in the world. Again, I'm not, you know, rating, I don't believe what's the greatest country or the best country in the world. There's no such thing. It, countries are just distinct countries. And we all love our countries because that's where we were born. Uh, and you love America, I love Ireland, I love Europe, but I mean, it doesn't mean it's, it's better, one isn't better than the other, it's just my country, your country, uh, and there are some advantages and some disadvantages. I think Europe is a great place to live, uh, a great place to, 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 to work, uh, and I think Europe has, has a great future, but so has this country, and we will, we will continue to do that closely together. Your Excellency, thank you for joining us today. It's been a wonderful Thank you very much. Oops.